Well, thank you everyone for being here. I really am so grateful. Sean, thank you so much for organizing this. And thank you, Corey. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Jason. And for everyone who's here live, it's really a gift to have you here. You're, happy, you're welcome to show your faces if you'd like, or you can not. And um, I would really love for this to just be an opportunity for us to look at the exhibit together and have a kind of Q&A and open-ended conversation about some of the themes that excite yeah. us. So um, I'm wondering if any of our kind of team members who worked on this and, you know, just in general are feeling really compelled. Um, I mean, initially just looking at the, the cover photo. Yeah. Um, I would love to hear any of your thoughts about it because I've been thinking of it so much as a really profound centerpiece of what this exhibit represents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a very moving, moving photo. Um, yeah, especially think early 60s, it's probably 1965. So yeah, what was going on in the world, you know, the whole representation of the, the you know the police in in minority communities it's it's uh i think that's one thing my father's photography it always somehow gets like a it's like a meditative like you can see the introspection in the in the subject and, and it, it's, it's it's almost like one of the most consistent aspects i think of his photos is that you, you can almost see the wheels turning and somebody's they're they're thinking they're feeling something it's not just you know and i think that's the, the yeah the juxtaposition in this there's a lot of thought going on in the boy's head you know um you know and obviously yeah this is so it's interesting also with my father the photographs that he, that were printed in his lifetime and then what we've expanded the body work to be since then. And this was always one that uh, he had printed, you know. So he was particularly fond of this one too. It's I not just, so, yeah. That's, okay, that's yeah. cool. Yeah. Wow, okay, well, I'm also wondering maybe as we're getting some thoughts from everyone, would you also just say a, word, a few words about yourself and introduce yourself and um, yeah, just a bit about you that okay. would be so great too yeah yeah so i got involved i guess about oh i studied fine art um did a little bit of photography and about 20 years ago we moved out of the house i grew up in it's only four blocks away but it was enormous so we had to downsize and also we'd been there since 1967 so like, you know, you start fluffing up all the stuff in the backs of the closets and in the basement. And when I moved in here, I realized we had so much more material than I was ever aware of. Um, and also we moved into a smaller space, so we had to become organized. And it started off, and I said, it's been 20 years now. Like, it's one of those things, like, if I would have known the scale of the task back then, I might not have ever have jumped in. But you, you just kind of get started and... Uh, I'd say probably the last 10 years, uh, it's almost full time. I get pulled away a lot, but it's almost a full time task. And then I, initially I started, we really started getting into it. Uh, I started using uh, interns from NIFA and then that's how we met Catherine, which yeah, now has been almost 10 years. Yeah, it's, I think, well, this month is my nine year nine anniversary. Year. Yeah. So oh. I went to... I went to RIT to study photography and yeah, nine years ago started as an intern, mostly yeah. just archiving the vintage prints that we yeah. had and then just never left. So <laughs> just expanded well, everything. I would love, I'm so curious because I don't think I've asked you before, Catherine, like what did, what was your first encounter with the archive and what was it like to start to delve into it? Because I just can't imagine like where, where, what, where were you? Um, yeah. I mean, I will say, I remember on when I interviewed, I believe we just started talking and then eventually at one point I realized that we'd been sitting here talking and we weren't talking about <laughs> the art anymore. We were just chit chatting, but uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think I understood the full scope of it until I was here maybe a year or so and it was 
just saw more and more and I'm like oh all of these things all this other stuff I was focused so much just on the one thing I was starting with that I was sort of tunnel visioned on that I didn't see the full scale and then I was like oh god there's so much more and I feel like we're still constantly finding new pieces new aspects things like that so it's never ending yeah oh my goodness I'm I feel so grateful that I was connected to Jan's work when I was in grad school uh because it just felt like such a wellspring of of not just art but knowledge about the world and ways of engaging with the world and especially being a student of anthropology I just felt such a resonance with his um it felt like field work and not just of his I mean of course the many mediums that he worked in but not just being a photographer, but actually being uh, an ethnographer, it really felt to me. Um, And so, I don't know, it sort of seems like a bridge actually to um, ask you, Jason, if maybe you can share a bit about yourself and then also about your encounter with Jan's work. And then of course, when I thought of you um, to get involved in this, I just saw this link between your work and his. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I'd be happy to talk about that, but Dara, could I ask you just to, retell a little bit about your own story with this archive and I, I know you've been engaged with it for a long time but but how did you get it how did, mm. you, get it? How did you find it yeah thank you for asking um so I was it was my first semester in graduate school I was doing a master's in anthropology at Columbia and I was in a museum anthropology course taught by Aaron Hassanoff, who is a friend of Corey's. And I believe that they had just coordinated somehow to make it possible for us to curate an exhibit of Jan's work as part of our course. And so we just started and that was our whole semester was um, meeting with Corey, going to the archive, figuring out how we we're gonna curate this exhibit. And then we had an opening at the end. And that was really my first museum experience, which was right. transformative for me because of course I've been working in museums since then and now doing my PhD in anthropology. So um, yeah, that I mean, I was just blown away by it. And then of course, over the many years that I was based in Poland, I felt even more deeply connected to Jan's work because of being in East Central Europe and traveling around the region. And it just continued to feel so relevant to what I was learning there. So I'm so grateful to be connected to the Yours archive still. Um, And Jason, you're one of the people who I've been really inspired by in Poland. And it's so nice to bring these worlds together for me of like my pre, you know, immersion in Poland. And then you are a big part of my Poland immersion. (laughs) Yeah, uh, well, thanks. I, I'm a photographer, or sometimes I say I'm an artist who photographs. I guess I'm both of those things. I, um, I'm also a writer. And um, uh, yeah, Dara and I met, I guess, several years ago now in Poland. And I only ever saw you in Poland. <laughs> I don't think I've even met you in the US anytime. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I've only, I, every time I see you, we're in Poland. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, but a lot of my my concerns uh, deal with, I guess what I could call a, a certain corner of the world of documentary or documentary art that has to do with historical memory and the complications of I guess what many people now are calling difficult history, and um, and and my work is takes a. a a number of different forms. Uh, some some of it is purely purely imagistic uh, collections of photographs or sequences of photographs. Some of it are kind of experimental texts that combine photographs and uh, and writings and writings in different modalities. Some of it um, scholarly writing. Some of it mm, basically poetic writing. And um, and then I sometimes write essays that that don't really use photographs at all. And um, and so I, I'm a, I, I kind of operate along that continuum. And I, I'm really happy to have had the chance to spend time with Ya and yours's archive, um, and uh, which is, you know, in a way on the opposite end of the migratory experience, uh, at least this part of the archive mostly is. And, um, and I'm also I, quite interested in, in questions about 
uh, archival relevance and and how it is that artists um, make their work new again for generations after them, what it means to inherit the work of an artist and, and how it is that an artist's accomplishment can blossom in time rather than wither in time. Um, I, this is something I've thought quite a lot about um, in relationship, especially to another a, a photographer who, I don't know, Corey, whether you might've known him. Um, his name is Lawrence Saltzman. He's, he lives in Philadelphia. And um, he's a, a, a photographer very much in sort of a, in a kindred spirit to, uh, to your dad. And, um, and I, I mentioned yours to, to Lawrence, uh, I don't know, a few months ago. And I think, they, I think Lawrence did know him at least a little bit. But Lawrence is now almost 80 and he's been working in photography for probably 50 years. And uh, a couple of years ago now, Penn, uh, special collections that University of Pennsylvania acquired Lawrence's complete archive and, uh, and, and then asked me if I would write a critical introduction to, to that um, acquisition, which I did. And I, in doing that, it, it really brought forward a lot of really very interesting questions about how work changes its meaning in time, especially with regard to historical developments that it you know, obviously cannot predict. Um, and, and I think that, that some of the photographs in this, just in this exhibition are really great examples of that. They're, they're examples of photographs that, that seem to acquire new levels of meaning and insight um, because of what happens after them. You know, the this particular photograph we're looking at now that, you know, that this of, of the child at the police barrier. Um, this is a photograph of intense beauty and relevance in this moment, you know, in, in the aftermath of 2020. Um, it, it couldn't be more beautiful and relevant, I think. You know, I, I can't imagine an era in which it could appear as clearly relevant as it does now. And, and there are elements of this in, in other parts of, of the archive that I can see also. And as a, as, a, as a sort of just a little anecdotal confirmation of this point that, that I'm making, um, after I wrote the introduction to your exhibition, uh, I sent a link to, to the, the yours archive to a colleague of mine at Emory, who is, a, she's a filmmaker whose work concentrates mostly on black girlhood. And she, didn't know the work of Jan Yours. She never heard his name before. And I, so I sent her these, you know, a link to these pictures. And the, the, her email was almost wet with tears when, when she replied. She said, these are so incredible, these photographs. How did I not know of them? Well. In her case, it was especially the, the photograph of the child um, at the window still with the bird. Yeah. Oh, can we look yeah. at that? Um, Catherine, yeah, yeah. what section is that in? <laughs> oh my like, maybe we can... in, It's the, the oh, here. Oh, here. Immersion. Immersion. Yeah. Immersion. And how do you get the photo on your phone from the visit? Oh, yeah. Is, oh, yeah, this is Ruthie Ann. Yeah. And also, mm -hmm. Jason, I'm so glad you mentioned this one, because if I'm not mistaken, Corey and Catherine and Marianne, isn't this someone who you know personally? Or yeah, there's some yeah. There's a, uh, yeah, I don't know how it could, how it could read on the, oh, let's see. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, oh, and that's, okay. this is two years ago. Wow. And there she is, yeah. <laughs> Uh, wow. That's what's up. So pretty much all these different communities, my father was there because he was had friends in those communities. Um, so that's, I think that was a little bit of, of so he's not just like a, like a tourist going through. He's, he's kind of embedded with a family in, you know. And the other one was um, a name who I'd always known. So a lot of the photographs in Spanish Harlem was with a family whose last name was the Maristani's. Mm -hmm. 
And my mother had told me a story that Jan had given or had told the, the oldest son who used to walk around the neighborhood with them, you should really be documenting this. This is your community. This is your neighborhood. Wow. And then I think they said the last time they visited, he walked them to the subway with the chain and he said, you really can't come back here anymore. It's, it's not safe anymore. And so I'd heard these stories and then his sister had died. We just coincidentally ran into her on the street. And so we kept in touch with her and then she passed away. So we got invited to the memorial service. And I met Hiram, who's the oldest son or the, of the family. And he confirmed the story. And he was just in a PS MoMA One show. And uh, he was the official photographer for the Young Lords, which was the Puerto Rican version of Black Panthers. Yeah. So it's kind of nice. And he said for, for him, he said to have been a teenager or being a teenager. And he said, here was this, this adult taking him seriously and engaging with him. And he said it was the right encouragement at the right time, you know. Yeah. Wow, that's so beautiful. And I yeah. wonder, just as we're looking through these sections, are there other people, like Corey, as you saw the photos that- well, If you go, or well, the one right below that is Johnny, who's drinking from the, yeah. Oh, that's Johnny too? So Johnny that's also Johnny too, the... same one, yeah. Ah, cool. And then below that is his sister. Wow. Let's you just see. go straight down. Is his sister. Which one? Uh, sitting on the bench. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh my goodness, that is, oh, I love this one. Yeah. Ah, I love her face. So beautiful. So with a lot of, with both these families, I, we made uh, digital files, you know, kind of an edit of their family photos, you know, because I thought also back then, not everybody had cameras. Yeah. So I said, we have a lot of photos, you know. Yeah. Wow. Well, well this is also said that they um, had an accident and they lost a lot of, pictures that they did have too so yeah being able to give them pictures from their yeah. childhood was really wow. emotional for them wow that's so beautiful i just pulled up the other one that i know is johnny yeah, johnny. yeah. yeah. wow that's so I, I love that i'm learning new things yeah. from oh, this oh, and oh go ahead go ahead i just heard something yeah. which that was, that was charlie she was saying with the or john yeah johnny. this one johnny. yeah yeah um, well, yeah, and then same with uh, my father was somehow friends with uh, the director of the uh, Chinese school on Mott Street. Mm. So he had us taking Chinese lessons on Saturdays. And so that's kind of, again, how, and we had, I think his first friend here in New York was this couple, uh, Jeannie and uh, Wei. What was her? Oh, uh, Jeannie Lu. Jeannie Lu? Jeannie and Wei, what was Jeannie, their last name? Oh. Right. So I think my father helped her move in in 1950. Wow. And a few years ago, she said, I still have boxes that I've never unpacked from where your father helped me move in. Wow. But she, she did calligraphy and she did all the text for the Maurice Sundak books. So that, well, she was, a, yeah, she did a calligraphy for, for, you know, for publishing for, so, all, you know, they kind of brought us into Chinatown, same kind of a thing as a, uh, not so much as tourists, but as, as friends, family, friends, you know. So amazing. It's, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I'm so touched by it. I'm, as I'm, I'm, I was trying to find some of the ones you're referring to. And I wonder, yeah. Catherine, if you would maybe feel comfortable speaking a bit about like how we got to this organization, because, um, you know, it just was a really fun process to do together over the past year or more. And yeah. I think it's unique. So I love for others to hear about how we came to this. Yeah, well, we kind of, I mean, we first we kind of did a big group, a pulling of pictures um, of children and childhood in New York City in this time. And then we kind of picked a couple that really stood out to us and we kind of made it a group feeling based on those key pictures and found others that we felt fit with it. And so like attention, we, um, it was a lot of different attention, but like of children looking, like the first one, we um, liked how much the child is not so much more interested in something else going on than what the adults are all focused on because that's not, not their priority or world really and then some uh 
the one below where the little girls kind of very much posing the or mimicking the pose of the other adults hanging out on the railing trying to be one of the one of the big kids hanging mm -hmm. out so uh, and then with the one of the mother with the two children at the top mm -hmm. they uh like her focus clearly probably trying to just get home and wrangle two boys who are clearly <laughs> distracted by many other things this so it was all really about kind of the a childhood attention and where they really more paid focus and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder, did you have a favorite did, or does anyone have a favorite one from this section that really speaks to you? Yeah, I, I, um, I'd like to go back to the top right, the one that you just were, were looking at, Dara. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that, that really amazes me about many of the photographs here is the symbolic reach of these pictures. And the way that they're, they, they have symbolic reach without trying too hard to have symbolic reach. They're not mannered in, in a sense. It's, it's, a, it's, it's like the, the photographer was simply so alert, so remarkably alert that even in the midst of pictures that are all about the street, the everyday, the mundane, the pedestrian, there's this some kind of timing and insight into the way things are working that ends up yielding uh, a, a very resonant kind of photograph. So for example, this picture, um, I showed this photograph to a friend of mine um, who, a, a friend of mine um, who said to me, you know what this is a photograph of? I said, he said, beside what it look, besides what it looks like it's a photograph of. I said, no, what is it a photograph of? He said, it's a photograph of a Ghanaian religious concept called Sankofa. And Sankofa is this, it's this, um, basically it, it translates to, I think literally it's to turn and go back. And it's symbolized, I think, mythically by the image of a bird whose feet are facing forward, but whose head and beak are turned backward. And it's a practice of taking stock of one's passage through time and uh, keeping one's attention moving in two directions at the same time. One moves through time in a, you know, let's say a forward direction, but one's attention isn't merely forward. And so you, you sort of have, forward and backward consciousness as you move through time. That's Sankofa, as I understand it. Wow. And so my friend said, this is Sankofa, except that what's really fascinating about this image of Sankofa is that it's the children who look back. Yeah. And it's, it's the children who are reaching in the backward direction for in, in, in the act of taking stock and retrieving, and it's the adult whose eyes are set forward, not the reverse. Wow. wow, that sounds like another essay. Let's do that. Let's do that <laughs> book too. <laughs> Thank you, that is amazing. I just... and, I, and that was the, an image I was not familiar with until this project. Oh, so cool. Which is great, you know. Mm. Wow. Well, I also love Jan's humor. And I think this is a photo that just is like, so, yeah. you know, like, uh, this is just so brilliant to me. Yeah. Like the, you know, kid peeing, the businessman, and also this uh, inner, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but um, yeah. you know, the relationship between this gaze, it's like Jan catching this whole thing. And then these people observing this little one, it's like, where's this person's parents? And like, yeah. you know, just so many questions. And then you see a truck and they're somewhere in a busy area. So there's, Oh, I just um, really appreciate the levity too, but the intent, there's just such a spectrum of emotion that Jan's photos evoke, even with children. And which I think that really impressed me when we, Catherine and I decided like, okay, let's go with this kid thing, which might seem sort of like 
not so serious, but especially thinking about um, what was happening on the streets of New York during a pandemic. And then we're, you know, during a pandemic curating an exhibition, looking at the streets of New York and imagining like, wow, this, this happened at another time in history. So yeah, those things speak to me. Um, maybe I can look at another section if any, and I, I guess I also want to invite uh, our audience, if anyone, you know, is feeling really moved to reflect on anything or share something, I'm happy to hear. Marianne, I'd love to hear from you if you're wanting to, that'd be so special. <laughs> yeah. No pressure at all. Um, so I just, all, the, all the kite flying is in Spanish Harlem. Oh, and that's all, all with the Maristani family. So okay. he has photos almost of the same days that Jan does. Like this wow. photograph, he has his own version of this photograph. The mm. same stack, the same vent, wow. you know. So I've been, yeah, I've been, yeah, right now, I'm st yeah, even, I just don't, I'm staying so local right now. Even getting on the subway kind of feels, uh, but I'd love to, you know, kind of print out a little book and bring it up because a lot of the people in the neighborhood, he said, are still there. Wow. So I thought maybe in the spring when it's warm and, you know, it'd be fun to go up there and just engage with people, you know, through okay. him, you know. Yes. Um, there's one in this section I wanted to pull up and hear any thoughts on. And there's a few in this section that I think this section was play. Oh, go yeah. ahead. Go ahead. But it's not there. The photo is not there. That photo is not part of it. That was the indicator. No. Well, there's another photo we have that's not in the show where they're all standing on the edge of the roof. And my mom was saying, uh, so they're up on the roof and there are a bunch of the teenagers are sitting there. And uh, he, said, he said, hey, man, you want to see some action? And my father was like, what? He's like, wait till the cops come. And he, he, they had a stack of bricks. And my father was like, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. You know, that's well, not really what I'm looking for, you know. But he was such a risk taker in his life. Yeah. And that, I mean, I'm just going to open this photo. But Corey, maybe you can yeah. speak a little to that. Because I, I think because of the resonance between us choosing the text from his, from Jan's childhood, yeah. and then also just maybe you can share a bit about where what that's from and i'm just looking at you know this photo of these like really risky scenarios of kids and wondering like how is jan looking at these scenarios and maybe not thinking it was as treacherous as we might think i yeah i think so very much so because if you look at the city even you know into the 80s there's that film downtown 81 where they follow, follow basquiat around with the lower east side hmm. and just how bombed out the neighborhood was and there was a, a couple of bars, there was a bar, bar that was called Downtown Beirut, because that's what it looked like. And that was just, you know, and, and so I was recently with like a, an Italian guy and a Russian guy, and they were talking about how, you know, New York City's, you know, going to hell in a handbasket. And I was like, well, how long have you been here? And they were here 10 years. So it's like, I mean, if you look at the city in the 70s, you know, it was burnt out cars and buildings were empty and, you know, all of that. Um, and yeah, free range kids you know we would we were probably 13 we were bicycling and skateboarding to school by ourselves in traffic no bicycle lanes and just this idea of what is safe what's not safe and i remember in in i guess early 90s with giuliani started tearing down the old playgrounds and he said these playgrounds aren't safe i said this is generations of us grew up on this so i think the same yeah you know i and, and, and almost barely see that kid though. yeah and the same thing with even some of Jan's photos of construction. You know, yeah. you could see OSHA did not exist yet, you know. I mean, this would never happen. This would never happen now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like there's a public pool around the corner from here. And uh, everybody who grew up in the neighborhood, every generation, they all climbed the fence and went swimming in the summertime in the middle of the night. You go swimming at, you know, come home and you go for a swim before you went home at four in the morning. Mm -hmm. And now, I mean, you could not, and the attitude was kids being kids and nobody, as long as you're not doing damage, you're not being a vandal. It was, you know, or even like the, the kid climbing there, Papo, you That's know? Fair. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he's <laughs> 10 feet off the ground or something, exactly. you know? <laughs> he's got some spiky bars sticking out below him, you know? No shirt on for protection or yeah. anything. <laughs> but. Yeah. No, I think the whole world, like what is, what is, what is considered appropriate or, uh, I had a friend the other day, she said, um, her, her son, uh, is going to Catholic school and he tore his pants 
And he wanted her to throw away the pants and uh, she insisted on patching. He's like, oh, the kids are going to make fun of me on a patch on my knee, you know? And it's, I mean, just these, these, these incremental shifts of what becomes normal, you know? Mm -hmm. And I mean, you look at all the people on the fire escape now, people that would, you know, <laughs> you know, even, even one person on a city on a fire escape seems risky here. You have like 20, on a, you know, and hanging off of it. Too. Yeah. Oh my God. I love these. These yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I love them. Well, you know, I just really try to meditate on what Jan was experiencing when he was observing these moments. And when I reflect on his writings from his childhood, which we included it in these sections to yeah. sort of parallel them. I imagine like he had such a wealth of experiences in risky situations and in yeah. exotic, you know, situations that were so different from his own you know, home place. And, and he was very adventurous up until this point. So he might not have even thought like, Oh, that there's any concern about what these people are doing. No. So yeah, that, that really strikes me as like the photographers. Um, I don't know, maybe Jason, you can say something about that too, in your photography practice, but like the question of how does the identity of the photographer actually change the essence of what is being photographed and what message is conveyed through it. Yeah, well, I mean, this, 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 the topic that we're talking about is something I think that you see in a lot of contemporaneous work. Um, you know, you certainly see it in Helen Levitt's photographs and you see it in John Gutmann's photographs. A little bit later, you see it in Roy D. Carava's photographs, uh, Rebecca Lepkoff's photographs. Um, this, this, um, sense of the city as the living room or the, the city as the, you know, the, the open, the free space of childhood. Um, it, it, I'm sure it was completely taken for granted in that era. Yeah. And um, it, it's only in, you know, it, it sort of makes us aware of our own narrowing or, or the, I don't know, the, the, normalization of a certain kind of social anxiety or social fear that we see the image of children free in public spaces, unsupervised, making their own games, making their own meaning, making their own worlds and living in them alongside whatever other worlds are going on that adults are living in. Um, the fact that this is a not a normal site any longer, or at least in the same way, um, is, you know, the, it, it, it's really a, a point of um, reflection uh, of, of broader changes that are hard to quantify. They're hard, you know, they're hard to account for. Why it is that that um, this this the, these kinds of changes have occurred? I, I don't know exactly why they've occurred. I mean, I can speculate like anybody can speculate. Um, but it is interesting to me that that as a there's something you know I never of course, I never met. Jan yours and I, I can only speculate about his manner as a photographer, but it seems to me if my, my intuition is reading the photographs that there's something extremely humble about his presence in the street. There's something very unassuming, um, very welcoming, and uh, that, that he somehow figured out how to be present with a camera in a way that normalized that fact for other people and because you know we we know that that when a the way that a photographer is with herself or himself has a great deal to do with how other people are with with the photographer and so there's something there's something very unassuming about these photographs or and and this is what's so surprising about them also is that they're very they're searing there's something searing about them that comes out of that unassumingness. They have this edge to them that, you know, like uh, yours is not a, to my eye, is not a photographer who's casual about what he's doing. He's, he's serious about what he's doing, but he, he, he's working in, in a way that is non, this sort of non-dominating of his environment. And, and that's a certain, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just imagining that I sort of, looking into his photographs, but you can tell 
you can tell something about like the vantage point of the camera. For example, in this picture you're looking at, you know, he's he's on his knees or he's or squatting or something. The camera is low to the ground, you know, the, the, the camera is waist high to a young child. So he planted himself there and he just hung around and he stayed and he, he observed and he kept going. And somehow he made it normal for everybody that, that, that somebody should be doing that. I really appreciate you saying that, even just thinking about the height. I think that factor with the kids specifically is something we might take for granted of like, of course, if you're a, you know, six foot tall, well, I don't know how, how tall was Jan. Maybe we should know that. Maybe that's relevant. I, I think like <laughs> five, nine, five, ten. Okay. So yeah, like yeah. A, six, a five, nine, five, ten person would have to adjust, you know, his body. It would be very much like a somatic exercise to photograph children. And yeah, it makes me wonder if any of you in the Corey, Marianne, Catherine screen, right. if any of you would be willing to talk a little about what was Jan's presence and um, like, how is what Jason's saying resonant with the way that he walked through the world as you experienced it? I'm trying to think, see, he was also, I remember somebody described him once as baby-faced. Mm. So I think it was very unassuming. Um, and, I, and I wonder if it's something he learned from living with the, with the Roma, with the gypsies, of, of a way of moving in the world. Mm -hmm. And then during occupation, again, a way of moving through the world without drawing attention to yourself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, I think that had to be part of it. Because that, that was one thing I had, uh, you know, you think about you know, Harlem in the early 60s and you know the, the the subjects are is kind of in, he seems invisible they're not reacting to him he's in the moment there with them but they're not like looking at him he's not he's not interrupting what he's documenting for the most part there's not much of an interaction um and most of the time even if there is kind of like a catch of a glance there yeah there's like an acceptingness to their gaze they don't seem for the most part like upset by his presence or angered by it they very much are like comfortable with his presence being there yeah yeah and i think you can see that in the photos that i'm pulling up now from yeah. the 30s yeah. that he was is in some of and also uh photographed some of yeah and these are the photos that he did as a teenager mm -hmm. so it's you know, um, it, it doesn't really seem to be like a learning curve with him somehow, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, these are much more snapshots, but they're still, you know, they still have a presence. They still have uh, engagement. I think also yeah. with uh, talking about how he, the childhood, how it being so different. I mean, Jan, how old was Jan when he... When he left, it was yeah. like, yeah, 13, 13, 14, something like that. Yeah. When he left to go live with the Roma and mm -hmm. traveled and didn't have a set home except for parts of the year when he would come back to mm -hmm. Eugene and Magda. But, you know, it was very much more openness to. Yeah. Ollie. He's insisting. So. <laughs> he has to join the conversation. Yay, good. Everyone's welcome. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, we, I mean, Catherine, maybe can you say a little bit about the background um, part that we chose to include? Because it wasn't, of course, the same photographs from the, um, you know, it wasn't yeah. the New York photographs, but like maybe we can share a little about why we justify that that was important to include these background photos of him. Yeah, I mean, I think it was important to show where he came from and I mean from the very start I feel like even in the early ones especially the ones where he's playing you can see that he had very an imaginative creative mind and probably a sense of adventure I mean obviously if you're 13 you can go off and live nomadically for several years that's not a 
typical kind of experience or mindset. So we wanted to show sort of that background and as to, I think also his, we felt like there was a, almost like a freedom that he seemed to really love in photographing children. And I think it's, he was very free roaming in his life. So there was like an appreciation of that sort of just freeness and openness that he was very drawn to. And then his, yeah, cause I'll say, um, cause his mother was involved in a lot of, uh, kind of, you know, human rights issues. And she'd met through Quaker friends in England. She'd met Gandhi in 1931. So I think he grew up also with Tagore and, you know, an awareness of world cultures, you know. Um. Yeah, yeah, the bridge between the, the early year, let's say the 30s and then the decades later is really striking, just that he was practicing already. Yeah. I think this one strikes me a lot just because that connection. So this was 1930s when you know, he was quite young and you can already see his ability of connecting with his subjects in the images. And I think that was so clear for us, especially in the, is it the contact section? Um, yeah, I think this was one of the most intense okay. sections for like Catherine and I, when we were curating it, because I just felt like every photo, it felt like this person is looking at me and there was, you know, a sense of, uh wow like look at these faces like they were really connected in a profound way that isn't just like a usual glance <laughs> yeah. and there's of course the camera but just to be able to capture that relationship of like person camera other person and now we're still engaging with this look uh you know decades or half a century later feels very profound to me there's a there was a comment that that um, was made a long time ago about Roy D. Carava's photographs that I find to be relevant here too, which is that D. Carava's wife, in writing about his work, made a distinction between tenderness and sentimentality, and she she described his work as being uh, very unsentimental and very tender at the same time. Mm. And and I think that something like that is true about these photographs also, which is to say to me that in photographing children, um, he he doesn't uh, infantilize them. He doesn't reduce them. He doesn't reduce their 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 complexity or their 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 depth uh, because they're children. They're fully humanly present. In, in that kind of complexity. And I think that, that that's very noticeable to me. And, and certainly he could have photographed children in a much simpler kind of way. Um, yeah, wow. Yeah, I am also in this section really struck to remembering that there are a few um, images of the Orthodox Jewish boys specifically in the section. But I'd love, I mean, just to hear from all of you, anyone, I mean, of course, my connection with Poland, this makes it very, especially profound because some of like this particular image, this reminds me of the streets of Kazimierz of, you know, in Krakow, it's like, Jason, you probably photographed this on Miodova Street that <laughs> yeah, right. was something like this. So, and then Corey, I don't know if you remember, but when I was working on that exhibit in 2010, I actually chose to focus on the Orthodox um, uh, community at Coney Island and the photos I chose were like the Orthodox kids on the rides and I just love the contrast of like the playfulness but still fully you know evidently um, religious so I don't know I love any thoughts about it because this just feels like a special niche of this collection that I feel connected to. I did there's a, a group in New York called uh, Choland so it's mm. pretty much people who grew up in the Hasidic community who aren't comfortable in, in the community for one reason or another, but yet all their cultural re references are there. So they can't quite leave either. Mm -hmm. And so they get together once a week, kind of a support group, socializing. And I did a slideshow for them once. And I think I was the first one to go home at like four in the morning on a or yeah, Friday morning, it was 4 a.m. And they were still going. 
Wow. And I, we're going through the photographs and they were all, and I wish I'd record it because they're all like shouting out names. They were identifying people. And I said to this guy who, you know, uh, Baruch, I said, how did they know? There was a lot of photos of rabbis and stuff. I was like, how do they know these people? This is a different generation. He said, these are their rock stars. Wow. So that was a neat, uh, another observation that somebody made was actually, because you'll see people with clean shaven, you know, within the Orthodox community, he said it's become more rigid since then. It was, it was a, little, a little looser, a little, uh, you know, but also, I think the same thing. I, I, I wonder what my father felt having come through, the, come through the Holocaust and then coming to New York and seeing this thriving community, you know. So. Yeah. Hey, Hi. Oh, I am the mom. Mom. Hey. But I want to say, when we came to America in 1950, yeah. we had no money. And we walked, and we walked, and Jan took photos with yeah. a little camera. And every photo that is shown here, Jan and Annabelle walked yeah. the streets. And we know all of the children, yeah. and we know all of Okay, okay, okay. We know all the children and parents, and we were adopted in the family, and we were invited for weddings and for the bat mitzvah. And Jan published a book, Only One New York. And after every photo is a story. Yeah. And we lived it because we couldn't afford a taxi or a car. And we had no money to go to restaurants. And we had five cents to buy a cliche. And we shared it between the three of us. And there was so much story, and ever, I, I couldn't sit still. <laughs> After every photo is a yeah. story. Yeah. This uh, Jonathan, uh, we celebrated Christmas. I'm 95 now, so. Christmas, Easter, we celebrated. Uh, I tell a quick story and then I will shut up. Like we it. had the first time that we were invited at Horton's house. She had four children and it was the first time we came in. And she, uh, uh, Jonathan, who was a little bum, took off Jan's shoe and he looked at his leg and he said, you are white all over. He thought that you were white on the top and then on black legs. So he was so surprised that he said, oh, you're right all over. <laughs> so that yeah. was a fun story. I have hundreds of those stories. Yeah. But now I like let Corey and Catherine, Catherine talk. <laughs> Thank you so much. And now I can't catch up anymore. So Thank here you. is my son. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Corey, okay. who doesn't talk so much. <laughs> We're so lucky. Thank you so much. I want to hear all of these stories. So. I know. Wow, we're we're very we're very fortunate. But that wow. was the other thing I thought because um, yeah, the cost of film, the cost of printing, um, that that it, somehow it, it's drastically different than digital. Mm -hmm. You know, like each, you're trying to make each photo count. 
you know, um, to meet people now. Uh, and I was talking to somebody on the phone once and I was saying how we had about, you know, I think 60,000 images. And he was like, oh, I shoot that in a year. <laughs> and I was like, okay, that's kind of the end of the conversation then. It's not, because uh, then every time that we go back through the contact sheets, the same sheet, we're seeing things that we missed the first time and the second time and the third time. We're still finding images on the same sheets that we've gone through many times. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, from a photographic point of view, even just about all of us having, you know, a device that allows us to take so many photos all the time. I wonder. Yeah. I, I'd actually like to look at the last section together. Maybe it can be sort of our closing section. So this is the um, section that Catherine and I included photos of Jan in, you know, in his older adult life and in, as him in action, just so we can get a sense. And then this section, we're so fortunate to have this text by Jason. So thank you, Jason. This was such a gift and a um, important sort of like, I love that you called it a meditation. Uh, I, I really felt that. And Thank you again for including that. I hope everyone here who looks at the exhibit will also engage with this text and yeah, yeah. just give you a sense of, yeah, it's, an, it's like, well, what did you call it? Not, um, maybe you can say something about it. I'm just thinking of our exchange about the format of it and how unique it is. Uh, well, you know, I, I think that one of the things about photography that's difficult and, and always, um, you know, always kind of an item is how long does a photograph ask to be looked into? Or even what words are we using to describe what it is to engage with a photograph? You know, we can look at a photograph, we can look into a photograph, we can look around a photograph, we can, maybe we can even look through a photograph. And, um, you know, pictures, especially in our time are cheap. They're cheap to make, and you know we look at pictures on our devices, and uh, you know we don't spend more than a a little tiny, you know, fraction of a second or two seconds. You know, looking at a photograph on your phone for five seconds can strain your patience, and so I guess the point of departure for me, and and this is just I, I don't know maybe particular to my own life as a photographer, but but I have a longer attention for photographs. And, and um, so for me, it's kind of natural to, to linger and to, especially to, to, to allow photographs uh, to expand. And, I, and, and some photographs you know, kind of lend themselves to this, I think um, others don't, but I think that the photographs in this exhibition really do. And um, they 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 give themselves away at different speeds, at different sort of um, in different registers and in different speeds. And so the the act of writing uh, a meditation on on photographs is an act of allowing that one's own response to take shape uh, in response to the picture, which is by definition a kind of open ended um, proposition. Many things can arise. Um, for me, some of them are, you know, very specific to the pictures. Some of them are are more general. A lot of them are questions about the ways that pictures are working. Um, and so I don't know. I'm I'm very grateful to have been asked to write something that was an honest response, um, not a not in the mode of a you know a, I don't know a critic or a scholar or something standing above work as it were, but rather to write something from inside the experience of engaging with work. And so this text is not a text that you, you may learn nothing about Jan yours by, <laughs> by reading this kind of text. Um, I'm not sure that there's anything called knowledge in here at all, but it is an honest, open-ended, it's a kind of uh, allowance of, of that experience into, lang into language or states of language. 
Thank you. I think that as you say that, I'm just feeling like that's exactly what I hoped you would feel entitled to do for this, especially because it echoes so beautifully what I think we all are talking about in terms of what Jan's work captured was this like honest, you know, even the physical movement of becoming an equal to his subject. So um, thank you for that. And I, I, as long as you're here, I wonder if you can just say a word about the book you did just publish and oh. if there's some resonance there between uh, this, or just in general, I mean, that is a pretty major thing that you've been working on. So maybe you could just mention it. it yeah, in. thanks. Um, yeah, I did just publish a book and you know what, Dara? It came yesterday. Yay! After you have it in your hand? Months, I do have it here. Yay, let's see months. it. <laughs> How exciting. And also, I, I just want to mention for anyone else who's here, thank you again for being here. And I know we have some other visual artists with us. So if any of you feel like saying or asking something, I welcome that. Um, this book of mine, I'm opening here, published, just arrived in the mail from where it was printed. It was printed in Istanbul, in Turkey. Wow. And um, it's called Alive and Destroyed. And, and the subtitle is A Meditation on the Holocaust in Time. Uh, it's a decade long project. It took me a decade to do it. Um, and there were lots of other things that happened in the midst of doing that project. Um, but what I, what I think it has in common uh, with, with what we're talking about here is the way that a photograph can function on the one hand as a kind of informational tool um, in the mode of say documentary, so-called documentary work, but it also can function in the mode of uh, visual poetics in which um, there's a direct, a direct poetic experience. I don't know a better word than poetic. I'm not that's not an honorific word. I actually think it's a poetic experience in visual form and it's not reducible to simple messages or, or data or, or um, uh, objectifiable knowledge. It's, it's a direct experience. Um, and, and I think that that, that, that quality of Poetics is definitely present in, in, in these photographs of New York and other photographs too, but especially in these street photographs of New York. And, and I think it's a challenge actually to viewers to, you know, when a photographer works this way, it, it's, it's, it, it makes the photographs more difficult because it's a, it's a kind of, um, it's a kind of invitation that, that, the photographer is, is making that a viewer may be equal to or may not be equal to. Thank you. Well, there's uh, so much in there. Thank you so much for that. And everyone buy Jason's book. <laughs> Maybe the last I'm, I'm not recommending it, but it's well, I, am. <laughs> no, I, I feel like I haven't held it in my hands, but I was, uh, in you know in your world over the years of you working on it so i can just imagine what might be in there and um yeah i i hope it will do very well it's certainly yeah, thank you important. um and sean i don't want to put you on the spot but if you feel like it i wonder if you know as we're kind of coming to a close i wonder if you want to share any reflections or uh, impressions or anything that speaks to you from your library perspective. Not necessarily. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm just grateful to have, have some insight into um, um, the inspiration and, and uh, just to hear and, and just to see uh, people working on something that they, they truly um, connect with. Um, and it, I find that very exciting. Um, and, uh, and and just grateful to, have, to be able to be a part of providing a platform for you all to, to, um, to, to have this conversation and then to, to collect this. Thank you so much. 
Thank you. Well, are there any final thoughts or comments? I think I'll put this full size of this up here while we're closing. I, I do have a question to ask Corey um, and Catherine. There's, I, I'm, you know, it's, it's obvious that the archive contains much more than photography and that his practice encompassed, you know, a lot of different ways of working. Um, and I can't quite judge how he understood the place of photography in, in all of these different kinds of activities with tapestries and paintings and prints and drawings. And there's, there's just so, there's such an effusive, you know, just an effusion of work. And I don't really know how, where, where photography sat in, in the, is it something that he, and, and the, the photographs are so different than many other things in the, in the archive. I mean, as a, if, if you look at his tap, when I look at his tapestry, for example, it's, um, there, there's a, a, just a completely different visual vocabulary that's, that's being used there. And, and so I wonder if you have any thoughts about that or if you can illuminate that a little bit. It's definitely something we struggle with because he did all this work simultaneously. So we did, we did a book, uh, a catalog for retrospective and we just ran the work chronologically, which is a little disorienting for most people. And even for me who I've lived with my whole life, it's a little disorienting for me also, but I think, yeah, it's, it's um, and it's also, he died at 55 years old. So, I mean, it's a phenomenal amount of material that he generated in a very short amount of time. Um, but I think yeah, it was, uh, I think he was just doing everything at the same time, you know? Mm. Some days he'd be, you know, they'd go for a walk, there'd be an event, they'd go do photography, they'd go home, they'd probably weave for a few hours, and, you know, next day he might work on a drawing, and then he, he, he had some kind of a rhythm that, you know, uh, at different, different mediums engaged him in different manners and different moods and different moments, but mm. uh, I think it was, it's all this kind of churning and a lot of cross-referencing. Like there's... Um, he did a commission travel around the world and we have color slides from that. And there's a slide of a moped in Thailand and it's an orange moped with a hot pink seat and there's a blue pinstripe. And we have in a tapestry with those exact colors that were like 10 years later, you know? <laughs> so I think it's, it's all these connecting, like perpetually connecting dots and kind of moving forward, you know? Mm -hmm. um, there is a whole section where he also starts using uh, abstract photos, uh, photos of abstractions that then become tapestries. Mm. Um, so we did a small show on that. Um, and that starts, I'm trying to think when that starts. I mean, I'm definitely by like 71, that's becoming part of his process. Um, abstract photos that then get translated into water, into washes and then become tapestries. Mm -hmm. um, that's, yeah, that's, you know, so I think when he starts off, it's much more, the, the early work is much more like on an easel, laying out sketches, working it up. And later on, it's, you know, abstract photos, then very clearly translated, you know, it's almost one-to-one, -one, just the, you know, the crop and the color, color combinations that, you know, from the photo, but. Hmm. Yeah, I just pulled this one up as you were speaking yeah. just to show them in action. And I love that kitten. I never noticed it. <laughs> <laughs> wow, so cool. I love that. And maybe this is a good one to end on because yeah. obviously your family and just really beautiful to, I yeah. mean, also striking in contrast with so many that are black and white to see something in color. But yeah, um, yeah maybe, maybe. Well, there was actually the thing. So when I was... You know, so what my mom was talking about earlier, how they had no money, and, and that was very much the family conversation. That you know, the, they never had any money; they were very poor. But then, I think that this studio, they were they paid so early sixties, they were paying four hundred dollars a month rent for the studio. It was this enormous place, and we were watching a um, documentary about William Klein. And he talks about how he gets uh, in house, I think for Harper's Bazaar, he's shooting for them and how they pay him 400 a month. What an amazing lifestyle this 400 a month afforded him. And I said to my mom, 
that was just your rent, you know, and then you still had food, materials, all the rest of it. So I said, it wasn't that you didn't have money, but your priorities were so completely different than everybody else's. Mm. You know, you were going to spend nine months weaving a tapestry and the wool was expensive and you were going to go out and, you know, it was like, so yes, you know, you, you had to make your, your priorities, but it wasn't, uh, and the priority was making art again and again. It was probably somebody once said to my father, why don't you even have a TV? He said, well, there's so many good things to watch on TV. I wouldn't get any work done. <laughs> you know, so I think it had this kind of element to it. It was, uh, which I can't imagine just like being that engaged all the time in, mm. in producing and, you know, engaging with the world, you know, mm. and I think that's probably why he liked photography as a, as a discipline, as opposed to, weaving or painting because it's not solitary you're in the world you're engaging with people you're interacting you're you know so i think it was probably a balance balance for him you know so wow thank you so much i i just feel like any time uh like the opening the yan yours book it's like whole encyclopedias can you know just continue so i i hope for us all of us here, I mean, I know for sure with me, I feel like, great, when do I get to do this again? Yeah. <laughs> it's, topic. it just feels like limitless. I told Catherine, I'm saying it, I'm documenting it. I'm like, if we get a grant to, yeah. to have a Jan Yours Museum, I, I'm yeah. in. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so much. Well, you know, it's, a, it's like a golden age of photography books right now. Yeah. This is, I mean, if, if, if there were any era that, that Jan yours would have dreamed of to have yeah. his book come to the world, it probably should be this one because yeah. there's, there are more interesting photo books of, of so many varieties being published now. It, it's a golden age, really. Okay. Hey, yeah. Yay. I love that. Hey. Okay. That seems like a very optimistic note to end on. <laughs> Obviously, we... Well, I hope we'll reconvene again soon, but I mean, I'm, I'm in for whatever way I can support okay. this. And thank you all so much. Thank you all who came here or watch us in the future. You know, Sean, just so meaningful to be able to do this. And Corey, Marianne, Catherine, Jason, it's really special to be with you all. Likewise, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Have a good day, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.